Let's get to work on the particles. We want them to be emitting at the top of our growing splines only. To create such an emitter, we will select all the nodes that make up our animation and we will copy them. But instead of pasting them with Ctrl V, we will use Ctrl Shift V. This will create instances of our nodes. This is indicated by these green lines and means everything we will change on the original will also be changed on our instances. I will quickly rename our instance base to emitter. The trick now is to decouple certain parameters so that we can change these without affecting our original nodes. We want to do this to the position and length of the emitter by right clicking on those and selecting D instance. Now we will basically switch the length and position. Right click on the length and remove the animation path before decreasing the value. To connect this back to our original animation, we will use a simple expression. Let's click the pin button above our inspector so it stays in the inspector and select the base. Now both nodes parameters are visible. In the position of our emitter, type in an equal sign and hit enter. The expression field opens. We drag and drop the whip onto the length of our base. Now, this animates just like our base, but they would actually not line up. This is because the position starts here at the bottom of our animation and the length goes up like this. This is why we need to subtract the length of our position. So we will type minus right length. Next, we need to animate the length. Let's go to the first frame and set the length to zero. And increase the length a few frames later. I'm not quite happy with this, so I'm going into the spline editor, select the length and change the position of the last keyframe. I don't actually want this to go above the horizontal line. We also need to animate the ending exactly like this except inverted, so our length decreases in the last few frames. And again, a little dot is still visible. We can change this by animating the border width again. De-instance it. But before changing anything, we need to remove the original animation path, which is still the same animation path that is connected to our base animation. We will simply animate this to be zero at the start, and the original width of 0 0.05 a few frames later. And exactly as before, we will invert this, so our border width decreases in the last few frames from 0 0.005 to 0. And since we want our particles to have the same color as the base, we will copy and paste the channel boolean clear and pipe our emitter animation into the mask input and our colored backgrounds into the background input. And now we have the animation that we will be using for our emitter. I will quickly sort my wires before we start the work on our particles. So let's add in a particle emitter, which is simply called P emitter. You won't be able to view this until we added in a P render node. Now, we can see that this has created a sphere that emits white points. But we want to use our emitter animation for this. So we will select the p-emitter and go to its region tab and set the region to bitmap. We will pipe the emitter animation into the newly created input of the p-emitter. When this is updated, we can see that particles are being spawned exactly where we want, but they're still white. So we go into the controls tab and under color change this to use color from region. Now they inherit the color of the image, but are too small to see. We will head into the style tab and change the style to Ngon. For the type we will be using circle. We can open the size controls and decrease the size. I will keep the size bigger for now though, so it's easier to see them. 
we will go back into the controls page because right now our particles are simply spawning and eventually dying without actually doing anything. We need to add some velocity. I will choose a very small number of 0.007. Currently they're moving to the right, so we will change this by changing the angle Z to 90 degrees. We want them to behave in a more interesting way, so we will introduce a P-turbulence force. Immediately you can see what this does. It adds an almost random force to our particles. I know what numbers I like already, so I will increase the strength on all three axes and change the density to 63. Something that I don't like about the P-turbulence force is that the turbulence is distributed pretty uniformly. We can add in a slight more variation by going into the region tab and changing the mode to when inside region and set the region to bitmap. We need to create a new node called fast noise and pipe that into the P turbulence. We will increase the seething rate and contrast for now and see what this does. As you can see, in some areas there is no turbulence applied and in others there is. We need to change a few parameters for this to look good. First, we should increase the scale parameter. I will also decrease the threshold on our P-turbulence node, so more of them are affected. And I will change the seething rate on our fast noise, so our fast noise simply animates quicker. Also, we shouldn't forget to change our output image size to 2000 by 2000. Otherwise, our fast noise image will be too small and will never affect every particle. Right now, when our particles aren't affected by the turbulence, they will still keep the same velocity, meaning that our additional noise driving the P-turbulence won't have a visible effect. So add in a P-friction. This will make our particles slow down over time, as for example air would do in real life. Our particles aren't spinning, so the spin friction won't have any effect, and by default the velocity friction will be slightly too high, so we can decrease this. Let's go back to our p-emitter and crank up the number. We will need a lot of particles for this to look good. For now I will set this to 500 and add some variance of 50. I'm also going to increase the lifespan to 200 and add in a lifespan variance of 70. Now that we have a lot of particles we can decrease their size. So let's go back into the style tab and change the size. We also want to introduce some size variance. This looks much better already. We could also go to the fade controls and change both numbers so that our particles don't just pop in and out when they are born or die, but rather fade in and out. This looks good and our particles should be done for now. Let's look at the p-render node. We could set the output mode to 2D and instantly get a rendered out image just like the renderer 3D does. But we will need extra output channels that this p-renderer doesn't provide. We will keep this mode to 3D, meaning that once we reach the p-renderer, this will simply be a 3D node like all the other 3D nodes in Fusion. We will add in another merge 3D after our p-renderer and connect the very same camera to this new merge 3D. And there we have our camera and camera movement in our particle scene. Theoretically, we could also merge this into our original 3D scene. But for now, I want to keep them separate, so we have an easier time compositing both together. So we add another renderer 3D for our particles. I renamed this one to R3D Particles. Let's take the output of our R3D particles and drag and drop it onto the R3D base to create a new merge node with the particles in foreground. 
Before going to the god rays, we can tweak the look of our particles slightly. I want to create a sort of lighting interaction between the base and the particles. We do that by creating a glow effect. And since the glow effect is more or less a blur, we will choose a blur node. We need to pipe in the result of our R3D base into our blur and increase the blur size. Next, we will merge this as the foreground after our R3D particles. We can change the blending mode to something like soft light. And to increase the effect, we will add a color corrector node after our blur and increase the gain and gamma until we're happy. A quick note from FutureMe. Looking back at this, I realized that this isn't the best way to achieve this effect. A color corrector with a blur as the mask input would look better. This is also something you will find in the example file I provided on my blog. Something that's still missing on our particles is motion blur. You might be tempted to go into your R3 particles and activate motion blur in the settings tab. And you could definitely do that, but this is an iterative effect, meaning it needs to render the frame multiple times depending on the quality settings. Two in this case means it will render two additional frames to create the motion blur. And for this to look good, we need to use at least a quality of eight. But in scenes with that many particles, this will be very expensive or slow to render. But even with a higher quality, this will never look as good as we actually want it to. This is why we are going to use a great feature inside the render 3D node, which is extra output channels. If you are familiar with 3D applications, you might already know what those are. Fusion can not only utilize them, but also create them with its own renderer 3D. As a quick note, sometimes there can be difference in anti-aliasing of your RGBA image and your extra output channels, which can end in artifacts. But for this project it won't be a problem, and in my experience this is more of a problem when using depth blur. Let's go to the R3D particles and under output channels activate the vector channel. If this render 3D node isn't already set to 32 bit, this is the time to do that. This is only a precaution to make sure that our extra output channels can write all the data they have to. Nothing will happen visually until we add in the next node called vector motion blur. By increasing the scale, we will increase the effect of motion blur. This still isn't super fast, but in this case it's much faster than the iterative motion blur and definitely looks better. I won't be talking much more about how this works, because this deserves to be a video or blog post of its own, but basically the vector pass saves the velocity on a certain pixel, which software like Fusion can utilize to calculate motion blur. In the next part, we will start working on our god rays and finalize the animation for our render.